Hello, 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 and welcome to today's episode of Her Version. This podcast is dedicated to sharing stories of struggle to triumph, a platform that allows individuals to tell their truth in order to inspire and uplift others. For those of you that are new to this podcast and like content like this, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you follow, like, and share. I am your host, Sabrina Victoria. Let's jump right in. What's the number one lesson you've learned from your life? All of it. I am a part of, I am not it. <sighs> and I say that by very comfortably from the co-pilot seat of the of my of my automobile here, that I don't supposed to drive this. I don't supposed to have the projections of where we're going. That's that's not in my pay scale. For me, it's it's being present, right? It's to be the co-pilot, to be, you know, watch everything go down and then kind of sit back and just see like, God, how could I, how can I help? What can yeah. I do? You know? Um, and again, it's, 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 I'm a part of something big, you know? And, and I think when I'm in that state, I'm most fulfilled and I have more room. Like we just said, there's, there's less chatter and, and there's, and I guess also like the more love I give, the more I receive. It's, it's you never run out of it. Yeah. So that I think overall is, is, is the big picture that I'm, I'm one of many. Thank God. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you balance that as far as, um, you know, giving love, but then also making sure that you're allowing time for yourself? How do you balance that personally? I always start with me yes. as selfish as that sounds. And we've heard of the, the example of, you know, the oxygen in the airplane. Um, I was listening again to, to Wayne Dyer this morning saying, if <laughs> no matter what, if you're looking for orange juice, you're not going to get it out of the banana. Like in order for me to give this, I have to have it. Yes. So, so that's where I start. And so for me, every, every morning, I, you know, I have a fabulous husband. He brings me my cup of coffee. I, you know, kind of like wipe my eyes, grab my journal. I write down anything that's eating my lunch from the day before. Oh, because I love clearly that. that's something I'm carrying over. And then what I do, it, and it's amazing. It's like, I just start having this conversation. Like, well, gosh, Jules, you know better than this. And oh, we did this once before. And so this dialogue, I guess, between me and Source takes place. And then what it is, it's like almost it like shifts me into okay, now that's cleared out of the way. What are we going to do for today? And I may listen to, you know, a meditation. I may listen to, again, like Wayne Dyer or, you know, somebody that fills that back up for me because it's like my mine is up and down, up and down, right? Like some days I'm full and other days I'm running on E, right? So I have to be very mindful of that. And so there's times, I mean, even like when I'm training, I, I, I'm a bodybuilder. And so there are times I need that extra oomph. And so I pop in my headphones that are giving me something about the grind, you know, something to fill it back up. And, and again, this is part of the we thing, right? Like I don't have to do this by myself. And yeah. so that's what I do in the mornings is I really just like set the stage, clear the crap, fill it back up and then move forward. That's awesome. I, that's I awesome. call it, I ease into the day instead of plunge into the day. Beautiful. Yeah, that's some power there. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Does your husband does your husband drink? He does. He does. He loves wine. In fact, when I met him, he was like a, a wine connoisseur. <laughs> um, no, and for the first few years, he was like, you know what, baby, I don't need to be drinking in front of you. And I was like, it doesn't really work that way. But you know what, I will completely accept the gift. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with this. And so then now it's gotten to the point where he's comfortable um, mm -hmm. drinking around me, but awesome. drinking wasn't my problem. <laughs> drinking was my solution. So um, as long as the problems fun. stay at bay, they, <laughs> as long as they stay at bay, I, I have no interest of, you know, putting the bandaid on. So. Yes. Yes. And now you have all the tools that you can use. So you don't have to use alcohol as a tool. That's great. Exactly. Because that's oh, really I all I had, remember? Limited resources. Yes. Limited resources. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
you know, one of the things that I love to talk about as, um, I guess, silly as it is in normal conversation, but since I have you here on my podcast, I get to talk about it, um, is disempowering beliefs. I think disempowering beliefs is kind of this like silent, invisible thing that we're all dealing with so heavily and not knowing it, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So I kind of want to ask, and and I love to ask this question because sometimes it brings up things for even myself where I'm like, oh my gosh, I have that. And I had Mm -hmm. no idea that I had that. And I love to be able to give that gift to myself or, you know, to the viewers listening. So I kind of wanted to ask, you know, what was one of the most disempowering beliefs that you've had in your life? And then what do you believe now? You know, that's the power of the word. I realize the power of the word. In the book that I wrote, the first page, it lists off probably 12 or 15 things that people used to call me. Okay. You drop out. You're a drunk. You know, you're promiscuous. You're a slut. You're, you know, and all of these words that gave great power to them to be able to say, but it also, that power um, also was transferred to me. And so then I started to live by those powerful words. And unfortunately they weren't positively powerful. And so that was my belief system. That's what I thought I was, you know, you call somebody a slut long enough. I'm going to think I'm a slut, Yeah. you know, uh, a, a dropout. Well, that one even rang true. Of course, that's where I'm going to. So, so it's like the, the most disempowering beliefs were everybody else's. <laughs> and that's wow. what I, that's what I really, one cool thing about getting sober is that because of the limited resources I had up to that point, um, I had to really bring it down to a very, very elementary state. So to see the word surrender, for instance, okay, was a mortifying word. Absolutely not. Do you not know where I have come from? Do you you want me to surrender? Like, I mean, it was like oil and water. Are, are you nuts? I'm out, right? Yeah. But then I would take that word, again, somebody else's word, somebody else's understanding, and I broke it down into a different word that resonated with me. The most um, profound example was the word unmanageable. I'm thinking, my life's not unmanageable at all. Look at, I am making it, right? And in my mind, I thought I was making it. But now yeah. I'll use words like, what's not working for you? Oh, well, that's a whole different thing, right? So then, so really what I had to do by doing this at such a minute, small stage of my being, I then yeah. transferred that into, I'm a woman who is now 50 years old. Do I supposed to look like that? Is that their belief or my belief? Yeah. And so I got to create over the years of these fabulous um, 14 years of sobriety, of ups and downs and living life, I got to create what's authentic to me by questioning it. You know, wow. like there's just like, it's almost like you just, it's almost like you slide into something like, oh, you're a woman and you should, you know, it's like this, this road that's been paved, but that road wasn't my road. And so I was really struggling with it. And so I had to really look at, is that their beliefs or or mine? And most of them were not mine because I didn't even have that level of concept at that stage. Yeah. And so that's what I do today. You know, wow. everything from the clothes I wear to the things I choose to do. I mean, I mean, oh, come on, I'm 50 years old and I'm a bodybuilder. Most women do not take that route, right? So these are things that are very authentic to me. Right. I love to sail. My husband and I are sailors. We we have a boat and, and we're in the Caribbean. And, you know, there's just there's things that I just if is it mine or is it yours? And this is my belief. So questioning them, like really just being like, hmm. And again, bring that into journaling. Yes. There's a great place to go right there with journaling. Yes. When did you get into bodybuilding? I did when I turned 40. <laughs> no kidding. I did. Girl, I just wanted what? to get what inspired you? Are you ready? Again, super small <laughs> micro. <laughs> Don't tell me somebody gave you a magazine or something. <laughs> no, I wanted <laughs> I wanted to get the cellulite off my thighs. Really? Mm-hmm. 
That's what started it? That's when it all started. I had a terrible body image issue, right? Because again, this is my vehicle. So this thing has to be perfect and it was never perfect. And so yeah. if you imagine living in Texas in our high temperatures during the summer, I would actually wear Spanx underneath blue jeans because I was that uncomfortable with my thighs. Now keep in mind, I'm 120, 120 pounds. I'm not, I'm not big. I'm not, it's complete delusional. Yeah. So what I did is I, uh, yeah, I, I thought, well, those bodybuilder girls, they don't have any cellulite on there. Oh, I want to know what they have. I want, I want that meal plan or, you know, I want that supplement or whatever. And so for the first year I, um, I locked in and I was on a meal plan and uh, for a full year without cheap meals or missing a day without a gallon of water. I mean, I was desperate for change. Wow. And so I did exactly what she told me to do. And, and I got the results that I was looking for. No kidding. And then your body obviously started drastically change. And then during that you decided, well, my body is looking hot. Well, you know, Let people tell you, people are like, oh, you compete. Like, no, no, I don't. <laughs> at the stage, I didn't. And then I was like, wait a minute. Is again looking at questioning, is like, is that yeah. even a possibility? And I was like, oh no, 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 this is fine. I mean, and I have to say, even at this point of my life, to say, like, I went to nationals last year and I placed in the top three at a national level. I mean, this wow. is the woman who just wanted to <laughs> fix her thighs. And wow. so even today, like to say that I'm a bodybuilder, it, it still doesn't fit. But I've been yeah. on that stage numerous times, so I don't know <laughs> when that's going to sink in yet. But but yeah, it, nothing ex ever expected. So yeah. what? So any cellulite on the thighs now, or has that disappeared? I do. Can you imagine that? <laughs> <laughs> now Are we just call it off season. <laughs> Are you looking at it with a microscope? <laughs> well, of course we do. That's yeah. what that for. It's a microscope. No, actually, what it did it is allowed me to, you know, have the ebb and flow of of changing my body. Actually, having some control over my body because okay. before I just kept doing the same thing and getting no results. So now I, I again, I've like fine tuned it. I know exactly what my body and how it responds to various things. I've went to somebody who specializes in this. Heaven forbid, yeah. I didn't have all the answers. And and so what it is now is like now I've I've seen myself get all the way down, you know, depleted and you know, every vein showing and you know, walking across the stage. And then I've watched how my body will slowly as I diet out, okay. will you know, go back to more of a normal state, and then actually appreciate that I need to have meat on my bones in order to build the muscle. Right. Yeah. So I've I've learned different aspects of it. So now when I see it, which I do, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm in off season. <laughs> there you go. There so you yeah, go. totally different wow. understanding. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. I love that you were still pivoting or still are, right? But pivoting at 40. I mean, that is okay. not something that people, the average person does. That's awesome. And again, is that your truth? What a or great example. Else's? Yeah. I totally have yes. done this all my life and it's really working out. <laughs> yes. Oh, I yeah. love it. Um, listen, there are um, still people here listening 47 minutes into our interview. So I just want to give a shout out to those of you that are hanging out, listening to Jules and I chit chat. We so appreciate the support and the love. Um, I would love for you, Jules, to tell us what you do. Obviously, everything you're saying is resonating um, with those that are um, hanging out with us on their lunch break. Oh, it's lunch. It's lunch here in Florida. So that might, that might be, there's a, there's a handful of people just chilling out with us. Um, what, um, what do you do? What's your business? You, you've written a book. Tell us what's going on. I have. I think I'm already, I'm doing it, right? I don't know if it actually has a title because again, I've kind of piecemealed this together, but you know, I'm a bodybuilder. I'm very strong in my recovery. So I'm a sponsor. Um, I also, again, like this writing of this book has been profound. It's been so amazing. So I don't know if I can put like a typical title out of what I do, except I do me and I do it at a hundred percent. What's the book <laughs> for? Who's it for? The girl in the back of the room who thinks she's the only one who's going through this. I've been in those shoes more times than I can even imagine. Um, 
And there's still times, like you said, I'm still pivoting today. Just because I got sober doesn't mean that all of that changes. It's It's been yeah. this process. It's a process. It's yeah. peeling the onion as we hear. And I just remember at that level of desperation and dis and being you know disconnected, you know, not attached to even the people in the same room with me. And now yeah. I'm learning that that's also with men, also with men, more so actually, because men socially is not acceptable for them to share most of their intimate feelings. So they're even more imprisoned than I was. More susceptible, yeah. for sure. Yeah. That makes sense.